So next up, everyone, we've got a real incredible pioneer in our space building some of you know our most um, loved project in the space, Polkadot. One of the co-founders of Polkadot is here with us, Rob Habermeyer is here to discuss whatever he wants to discuss. I'm not exactly sure. So yeah, Rob, I'm excited to, to hear what you have to say for us. Sorry for the delay. Um, no, Aiden, no, no problem. Thank you, Aiden, thank you. Um, awesome. I'm gonna be talking about parachains today. Amazing, amazing, looking forward to hearing more. I'll talk to you in maybe 25, 35 minutes, however long you need. Sounds great, thank you very much. Uh, I gave this talk a little bit earlier today at our Polkadot Decoded event, um, but I'm going to give it again because it's it's good information. Uh, make sure it's coming through okay. Um, yeah, so this is going to be all about parachains and 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 how we're implementing them, what they are, what you can do with them. Uh, we're excited to be working with Chainsafe to implement Polkadot as well. Uh, Chainsafe is doing an alternative implementation. I'll be touching on on that topic as well uh, shortly. Um, yeah, so a little bit about me. I'm one of the co-founders of Polkadot. Uh, I've been with the project since before day one. So really thinking about Polkadot and about parachains uh, as a tool for scaling since mid-2016. I'm also the co-founder of a new project called Hypersphere which is uh, focused on the Polkadot ecosystem. It's an ecosystem growth project for uh, funding and building uh, key aspects of this parachain ecosystem that we're gonna see emerge once those launch. I think there's gonna be a huge explosion of teams building on this new technology. And of course, you know, my goal is to support that and nurture that and grow that uh, to be you know, as, as powerful as it can be. Let's start really high level. Uh, treating parachains as a disruption. So I want to zoom out even from just the world of blockchain and, and sort of reorient ourselves where we are trying to get, what our goals are philosophically. Uh, so our end goal as Polkadot is to help people organize better, to be better coordinated, to get fair deals and to bring more markets onto the internet. That's what the blockchain space is really about. And I think it's why each one of us is here today in one way or another. I think that that reason is gonna present itself differently to each of us, but at the core, it's this belief that things can be different, that institutions are incredibly complicated. Social media is incredibly complicated. The world of finance is incredibly complicated. Politics are incredibly complicated. And there's no ledger, there's no record, there's no transparency. It's so easy to be uh, taken advantage of by unfair power dynamics. And you know that's, that's what we're seeking to alleviate. It's really easy to get lost in the details of all the complexity and with technology doing what it's done over the last couple of centuries, like it just blows up. And the amount of surface area that we have to contend with is incredible. And it's, it's overwhelming. We, we, can't, we can't work with that. So we need to make things simpler. We need to allow people to transact more fairly and expressively to really look after what is truly important to them, how they plan for their future or their family or how they work in a productive way and are fairly compensated for their time, skills and labor. So that's where we're coming from. I wanna briefly talk about parachains being the realization of the last decade of blockchain development technologically and philosophically. We've been building blockchain clients and nodes for the better part of five years now. Before that, there were about seven years of Bitcoin development. I'd say five years of heavy Bitcoin development. So that's the second half of the Bitcoin era. We've spent building this ex expertise, cultivating this expertise and figuring out the tools th that we have at our disposal, as well as what we want to achieve. And that has culminated in parachains. We're gonna see this changing how we use the internet. 
we're already seeing this to a small extent on Ethereum, and there are scaling challenges that we're attempting to break through. But I want to break it down into four key categories. We're going to see new means of transaction. So new means of exchange, payment, finance, savings of ownership. We're seeing that to a large extent already. Building to a lesser extent, but it's, it's happening. We're going to see new business models, entrepreneurs, funding mechanisms. We're going to see new ways for people to organize from micro to macro scales. So humans coming together from disparate locations with a shared purpose. And we're going to see better rules for governance of really, I think, focusing on this society aspect of people coming together and setting the rules of engagement upgradable rules of engagement on chain. Because what blockchains are really about, in my opinion, is democratizing access to rules. Like the domain of, oh, should we employ rules versus discretion has historically been something that's only been the domain of large institutions, states, central banks, et cetera. Uh, whereas now that question is something that we can apply at a much smaller scale. And I think it's a trade-off certainly worth exploring. I have this diagram here to represent, it's a terribly complicated diagram, I know. We, we clearly spent a lot of time on it. Uh, to represent something that we're already seeing in the decentralized finance space, which is uh, people from all over the world being united around a token that incentivizes some pattern of behavior. So that even though they may be in disparate locations, different parts of the world, they're all driven by that same incentive and same purpose. And that's what I, referred to as self-organized blockchain token communities. You know, people who can really seek out that behavior or that action that they want to occur and find a protocol or build a protocol that encourages that action. Let's zoom in back towards blockchain technology. Parachains are disrupting all existing blockchain technology. By that specifically, I mean parachains striking a happy medium between smart contracts and layer one. Layer ones being chains like Bitcoin or Ethereum or Zcash or Monero. See, parachains have all of the sovereignty and specialization that layer one has. They're fully in charge of their own destiny and they can specialize for a particular problem domain. They've got a lot of tools at their disposal. It's, it's common in engineering that when you're solving a difficult problem, you want to be able to specialize your tools, specialize your mode of computation, your data structures, your algorithms for what you're specifically doing. That's really difficult to do in smart contracts. However, when you're building a layer one blockchain, one of the main challenges is to gather security. So parachains have the same property of inherited security that smart contracts do, where they get all of their security from the chain that they're attached to. In this case, the relay chain, that's DOT or Kusama. Let's focus on the smart contracts aspect. Smart contracting platforms are too general for most use cases. You know, technically they're something that's called Turing complete, which means that, you know, if you had unlimited time, you could emulate the entire universe within typical smart contracting platform. However, in practice, you pay gas for the amount of computation that you use. And well, building with a smart contracting platform can often feel like doing construction out of sand. The operations that you have at your disposal are extremely fine grained. You pay for every single grain of sand that you use and you have to stop and count each one. It's tedious and it's expensive on the gas side of things. So what parachains are about is allowing people to specify their building blocks, zoom in on their problem domain, and build the solution that fits without paying gas fees for every tiny step in the middle. Another way that sets parachains apart from smart contracts is that they're proactive, not just reactive. So what I mean by that is that smart contracts are event driven. They don't do anything until somebody wakes them up. So, you know, you can't say, oh, the smart contract is going to do this in 10 blocks or 10 blocks after. You have to have an incentive scheme where like, okay, somebody gets paid to call the smart contract in 10, 10 minutes or in an hour. When you're building a, a freestanding blockchain, you have that control. You can say, okay, every 10 blocks, the state transition is programmed to do this. It's going to send out a broadcast. It's going to issue new tokens, something like that. So that proactivity is an incredibly powerful tool for developers. And I think one of the, the main ways that this, this manifests is that you can implement smart contracts on a blockchain, 
right? We've seen that done many times, but you can't really implement a blockchain on smart contracts. So let's look at layer one blockchains. I think the main issue that we have with the ecosystem of layer one blockchains is that everything is very disparate. You've got a bunch of chains that are kind of trying to do everything and be everything. So they're very general. They're, they're loaded up with many different kinds of, of transactions. And uh, the result is that you, you run into the scaling barriers really quickly. So our ideal ecosystem is one where you have a bunch of different blockchains that each do something specific. Now, those blockchains might not make sense on their own, but when you view them through the lens of the broader set of blockchains that they can interact with, so say you have a blockchain for like zero knowledge proof verification. It's like, if that was the only blockchain, it would be kind of confusing or be like, okay, what do you use this for? But when you start to plug that into an ecosystem of blockchains for decentralized finance or for governance or for staking, or maybe one for smart contracts, all of a sudden its value proposal grows and the value proposal of the whole network of blockchains grows as well. So that's what layer one blockchains really don't have at their advantage. You want these blockchains to be able to quickly and easily and cheaply interact with other chains so you can build that network effect of applications. One of the difficulties of building a layer one blockchain is, as I mentioned before, gathering a secure validator or miner set. You have to get this community, stakers, miners, to protect you against threats because our security is only defined in an economic model where everything has a price. And if you're competing with all of these other layer ones for security resources, the price to 51% attack your blockchain might actually be pretty low. So the idea with parachains is that all of them can come together and share the same validator set and thus share the security. They don't compete with each other for security and thus the whole system is secure. The way that you can think about it is that you can't 51% attack a single parachain. You have to 51% attack all of them at the same time. And that makes them more secure. Let's dive deeper into the technology. So parachains are the execution core of Polkadot. This is where all of the actual code, you know, transactions of various different kind, decentralized applications is actually gonna live. All the stuff that happens on the relay chain, that main chain that provides consensus, uh, is really about sort of enabling that execution to happen one layer down at the parachain level. So the information that you need to know about parachains to understand this talk is that you have a relay chain. So in practice, that's say Kusama or Polkadot that is providing consensus for all of the registered parachains. And those are gonna be registered via auctions or perhaps via governance in the case of common good parachains. They advance in lockstep. So you can think of it as all of the parachains having blocks at the same time. There's not parachain A that's having a block and then parachain B that's having a block two seconds later. They all have blocks at the same time. And if there's a chain fork, a contemporary fork due to consensus uh, network split or something like that, you know, all those things that just happen during normal operation of a decentralized consensus algorithm, they're gonna kind of roll back together and then re-advance together. Some of those parachains might implement bridges to and from other layer one blockchains. I'll go more into that later, but the idea is that, you know, the Polkadot ecosystem isn't self-contained. We want to be able to interact with those other blockchains like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Zcash, because there's still a lot of useful work happening on there, a huge communities that we want to be able to interoperate with. And you might've heard the term sharding thrown around with respect to blockchains, the idea of splitting out uh, all of the work that the blockchain does into many chains to spread the load and then having those chains sort of work together. So that is in fact what Polkadot is. Polkadot is a form of sharding, but typically when you hear about sharding, it's referring to a homogeneous set of chains where all of those chains do exactly the same thing and have the same state transition function. In Polkadot's case, the sharding is heterogeneous. Each of those chains defines its own rules, its own business logic, its own means of transaction, or even whether it has transactions. Now, para-threads are a special innovation on top of para-chains. Now, there's a certain amount of para-chain slots that are going to exist. You know, this doesn't scale infinitely. It's a scaling solution, but it doesn't go forever. There's gonna be say, X para-chain slots. Uh, and the idea is that each one of those slots is going to be used to produce a parachain block once every six seconds. Now, if you have a 
parachain, that means that you kind of own a parachain slot or lease a parachain slot, and you have the right to author a block once every six seconds. However, many use cases, for example, a weather chain uh, or um, a, a, a governance chain or some kind of notification chain, they don't need to author blocks once every six seconds, and it would be wasteful for uh, the slot to be leased but unused during that amount of time. It's also cheaper for the users if they only need to pay for those blocks that they actually author. So enter parathreads. The idea behind parathreads is that we're going to reserve some amount of parachain slots to be used to multiplex many parathreads. So you might have, let's say, 20 parathread slots, and there might be 20,000 registered parathreads that are all pay-as-you-go parachains. So if you need to author a block once every hour, a few times a day, once a week, that's just going to use one of those dedicated parathread multiplexing slots as you go. So this is going to serve as a much easier onboarding ramp for newer projects uh, as well who can't commit yet to acquiring a full lease on a parachain slot. And the thing is that you can actually swap from a parathread to a full-on parachain or vice versa. So here's a diagram showing uh, all of the different components of the relay chain polka dot parachain. So we have the relay chain at the center. This is sort of a snapshot in time. So we can see you've got the relay chain at the center and all around it, you have different parachains attached to it. And those parachains each have some validators assigned to them. So the idea with polka dot is you have this broader validator set and over time, those validators are kind of shuffled around onto those different parachains. So you might see some validators on parachain A now, and then in an hour, those same validators are gonna be shuffled around and some of them might now be on parachain B, some of them might be on parachain D or Z. Um, so they all get moved around um, for, for predictability re reasons. Um, you also have collators who are responsible for authoring the blocks. So the flow that you have is that collators create the blocks, send them to the validators to check and then the validators come together and achieve a broader consensus on, okay, what's the next parachain block for each parachain? You can also see parathreads outlined here. So that's a slot that has many many little sort of parachains, those parathreads uh, assigned on top of it. And you can see bridges. So that's a, from the perspective of the relay chain, just a normal parachain. But in fact, what this parachain is doing is interpreting the consensus algorithm of some remote chain so that it can ferry messages back and forth between that chain. What can you do with parachains? Well, I'll go into a few kinds of parachains, which aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, that can give some insight into uh, how, how teams might approach the parachain design space. You're going to have parachains with their own tokens, like what we've seen in the smart contract space, where those smart contracts have a specific token that's designed to incentivize particular behavior pattern, usage pattern, uh, or pay fees to the network to some actors. So many parachains will have their own token. They're going to be used to pay for collators or even accumulate relay chain tokens, so DOT or Kusama, and also denominate fees in the network. One of the downsides of having a lot of tokens floating around is that users have to deal with a lot of tokens. I think at some point we're gonna have really, really good decentralized exchange, some kind of like ZK snark powered magic that just makes stuff happen instantly and fairly and cheaply uh, so that you only really have to worry about one token. It automatically gets transmuted here and there. Uh, but realistically, we're not there yet uh, and it is easier for common good style chains to not have their own tokens. So that's things like, let's say, working with smart contracts or doing balance transfers, interacting with governance, uh, doing staking, uh, maybe an interest rate platform or something like that. Um, those parachains don't necessarily need their own token. And that makes it easier for the users to deal with because they only have to own the one native token. We're gonna see chains, and I've alluded to this a few times already, that are specialized for a particular use case or application that would be difficult or heavy to implement as a, as a smart contract with low fees. And I think those are gonna be things like oracles, identity, file storage, or zero knowledge proof verification, as I mentioned before. We're also gonna see parachains that are not specializing around a particular functionality, but they're gonna be specializing for a particular community. They're gonna exist as a bunch of little modules that are tied together that each serve a little purpose, 
But those little purposes together provide a set of tools that, you know, let's say financial people um, are really interested in, or maybe stakers are really interested in, or uh, or, or people who are, are participating in, in a decentralized justice system for organizations, dispute resolution, things like that. So a few specific examples, smart contract parachains. Now, the way that I think about smart contracts is that smart contracts are very familiar to people. Uh, they're relatively easy and cheap to deploy. And they're specialized in generality and composability. You have all these smart contracts floating around with within one state transition mechanism, and they can all fit together. You know, the way that, that people have been talking about money Legos and interfaces and all of this stuff just fitting together and, 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 and working together. So given that it's so familiar, I think we're not going to see smart contracts going anywhere uh, for, for a good amount of time. So a parachain can also provide an implementation of smart contracts and allow users to deploy their smart contract on the parachain. Theoretically, because parachains are such a general execution model, you can support any type of smart contracting language. And there, there are loads of them out there. In practice, Inc, which is Parity Technologies, uh, WebAssembly based smart contracting language, and the EVM, Ethereum's virtual machine, are ready to use already. In fact, there's a project called Moonbeam that's building a parachain designed to uh, host EVM smart contracts. One of the nice things about having the EVM is that it's going to enable those developers who are familiar with the EVM stack and have worked in the Ethereum space already to bridge over to the Polkadot ecosystem without having to learn a new skill set. And of course, developers are incredibly important when you're building a community and building an ecosystem of projects. One of the other really cool things that we can do with parachains is offload relay chain functionality. Now, right now, the relay chain does a bunch of stuff. It does staking, governance, balance transfers, as well as parachain consensus. And our thought process is, well, if we have parachain consensus, we could just offload a bunch of that work like staking and governance and balance transfers to parachains. Uh, leaving the relay chain to spend its time only on parachain consensus. So that's really going to enable us to push that uh, that scalability solution to its limits because the validators of the relay chain aren't going to be spending time on verifying uh, those other types of transaction functionality because they that just won't exist on the relay chain. So with that, the relay chain might become the, the world's fully transactionless layer one blockchain. And we also have bridges. So there's so much happening on Bitcoin. There's so much happening on Ethereum uh, that we really want the ability to access assets from this ecosystem. So to bridge over Bitcoin, let's say, or to bridge over ETH, to bridge over DAI, um, and also vice versa, when there are going to be there are going to be a lot of different tokens uh, or, or representations of value NFTs that are going to be instantiated on the relay chain. We want those to be able to be sent to uh, the Ethereum blockchain, for example, so that people can transact with them there. And we're going to see uh, we're going to see a lot of different uh, use cases revolving around that. Now, the downside of bridges is that uh, the messaging latency is somewhat slower because you have to wait for consensus finality on both sides. The nice thing about the relay chain is that everything that's enclosed within the bubble can send messages to each other really fast. Whereas everything that's outside of the bubble, you can still send messages back and forth, uh, but it is going to be with uh, higher fees and, and higher latency. Parachains are also social organizations. And this is something that I think gets skimmed over a lot, uh, really this organizational capacity that we have with blockchains. I mean, we've definitely seen in the DeFi space on Ethereum, a lot of governance stuff happening. I mean, lately with mergers and acquisitions as well. And I think this is exactly the kind of stuff that I'm alluding to in this section, where parachains represent the aggregated financial and social capital of their stakeholders, of the users, of the token holders, of the governance participants, of the developers. And that's going to be the discussion forums. That's going to be their governance mechanisms. Um, and parachains are actually going to have the same permissions on Polkadot as a regular account does. So that means that a parachain can participate in the governance of the relay chain. And the actions that the parachain will take will be representative of the actions that the stakeholders of that parachain believe in. 
So they can vote in referenda. They can sit on the council, potentially. Uh, Polkadot's governance has a bounty system where uh, the idea is that you, you elect knowledgeable uh, drivers of some particular field as curators for a set of bounties and bounties being say like requests for proposal. We request that some solution be submitted to this problem and then a bounty will be paid out. So a parachain could actually act as a bounty curator for the main Polkadot treasury. And that would allow it to advance the agenda of Polkadot. Parachains will also have their own governance mechanisms. So just all of those things that Polkadot has available for governance, that's the council, the democracy module, you're also going to have those available as well as other governance mechanisms that the parachain author might write uh, for, for managing its own governance. And that means that the parachain might have its own treasury to allocate to advance its agenda. One of the nice things about the treasury is that it lets us, not perfectly, but it lets us allocate for common good better than uh, better than is possible without. And the way that I've been thinking about it lately is that parachains are, are digital nation states and Polkadot is enabling those parachains, those developer teams, the stakeholders to form unions and exercise comparative advantage to the fullest. So that's each parachain really finding its niche in the market and finding its imports, inbound messages and exports, outbound messages that really serve the market best and enable it to extract maximum value and create maximum value. I'll give a development update as well to let people know where we are now and, and, and what's coming next. So the first thing I wanna do is recognize the developers who are working on this project. There are so many more that I couldn't even fit on one slide. Like you would just have tiny, tiny pictures. Uh, these are specifically the people who are working on building parachains, parachain networking, parachain consensus. <clears throat> and these people are on GitHub. You can check them out. Their GitHub usernames are there. You can see they're committing code day in, day out to really make this happen. Uh, and that deserves some recognition. They're not super public figures, but uh, it's important what they're doing. One of the other things that we've been doing this year is setting the stage for alternative clients and future developers. Now, what we had built before then was a prototype of the parachain consensus code. Now, with the level of value that's going to be committed to the chain, we need to know that this code is rock solid. So you can't go and deploy some prototype code that appears to work, but you can't really reason about. Uh, you want something that the researchers can understand. You want developers to be able to have faith that their implementation is correct. You want to be able to iterate on ideas quickly. So that's why we established something called the Polkadot Implementers Guide. And it's served as a reference manual and testing ground for ideas. The idea is that we're going to write in detail everything that we do for parachain consensus and runtime. And the researchers who aren't hardcore Rust devs can read this, contribute to it, and understand what it's saying and make sure that it matches the security properties that we want and the um, and the papers that it, it, it would effectively implement um, those protocols designed in the academic papers that are submitted to conferences and that they've, they've built. And then the Rust developers not being uh, math or computer science PhDs don't have to dive super deep into the papers. They can build based off of this implementer's guide and have confidence that the code that they're writing does what's expected. So it serves as this bridge between research and implementation that's understandable by all. It also will serve as a future reference for other implementation teams who want to build Polkadot parachain hosts. And it gives us a huge amount of confidence in the strength of our software architecture and the modularity of our design. So here's the code in numbers, and this is just the, the, the uh, the production ready code that we've been working on this year, we're in 31,000 lines of parachain consensus code. That's over 300 pull requests merged. I, I was counting and I just lost track at 300. I was like, okay, there's pages and pages more. There are a lot of pull requests, um, but that includes 95 issues that were closed for features or enhancements. So each one of those might be a specific piece of functionality, a specific moving part in the system. Uh, that serves a role. 
That implementer's guide that I mentioned uh, is 47,000 words. It specifies 19 subsystems, which are key components within, within the node side of the code, and 11 runtime modules, which specify the business logic of the blockchain itself, of the relay chain itself. We've been running stress tests lately with this code. We've been getting it up to speed and, and ironing out the last few bugs and doing tests. And we've gotten it up to 20 validators and eight parachains on the Rococo testnet. So where are we now? We've got this V1 production parachains code <clears throat> entirely specified within the guide and mostly implemented in Rust as well. There are a few modules remaining around the availability and validity protocols. So those are some of the security protocols, but they are already specified in the guide. And this includes message passing. It's an earlier form of message passing called HRMP, horizontal relay message passing, where messages are passed through the relay chain itself, as opposed to just hashes of messages being committed to the relay chain and then uh, transmitted via the network. So that's gonna be way faster and that's gonna come in a future release. But there is message passing and the APIs are gonna be roughly the same as the XCMP uh, messaging APIs that uh, exist once we've done implementing that feature. We're just launching the Rococo V1 testnet for parachains, and this is going to be a uh, a public testnet where anybody building a parachain can come and register it and already start to play around with interoperability, start working with other teams and building cross-chain protocols and such. We've also started an audit of our code base. So uh, we're having SR Labs look deeply into our code and find issues, look for architectural and conceptual issues, uh, and we're going to be fixing all of those as they come up. We're not going to be deploying anything until those audits are completed. So the next steps are further network optimizations and stress testing. We want to see how far we can push this. There are a lot of low hanging fruit with respect to optimization that we haven't plucked yet. And I think we can get it to go much, much more scalable than we have already. We need to complete the ANV protocol code. That's the those final security features that are fleshed out in the guide, but not yet implemented in Rust. There are a few improvements that need to go in with respect to parachain auctions and crowdfunding, uh, with respect to how the bond is returned to crowdfund participants, and also uh, things like whitelisting or caps on crowdfundings. And we're gonna finalize those audits. Then we're gonna begin a rollout onto Kusama and Polkadot. What that's gonna look like is a most likely, we're going we're gonna to put it onto Kusama first, but we're not putting it on there until the audit is finished and, uh, and all of the security features are in. We're going to be deploying common good parachains, I'd expect, first. So those would be deployed via governance as opposed to auctions. Then we would see auctions on Kusama, and then we would start to see common good parachains and auctions on Polkadot. Now, I don't want to commit to hard dates for any of this, but I will say the code base is pretty much feature complete. So it's really all about ironing out uh, those last few bugs. And we're gonna be deploying para threads and rolling those out after the initial release of para chains. The para chain consensus code that we've written already supports para threads, but there's still a few open questions around pricing and data availability, as well as the other side of the code, which is how collators will actually participate in para thread auctions and such. Uh, which still needs to be written. So we're going to have some milestones after the initial rollout of parachains, uh, which are going to be about knocking out those issues. Well, that's the end of my talk. Uh, I suppose I have some time for questions. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much for that incredible talk. I really appreciate, you know, just how you covered everything that we need to know and people need to know in general. And I know that uh, there are lots of people who are really appreciative of that. Um, and I know we are definitely. So just to hop into the questions, we got, what's the difference between Polkadot versus Cosmos with regards to shared security? Obviously, this is a pretty loaded question. But yeah, just from a high level, what, what's your perspective there? A different security model. So Cosmos is like, it's a network built entirely out of out of bridges. So um, all of those chains are required to gather their own security resources, uh, their own staker and validator sets, and then they communicate with each other. Whereas with Polkadot, all of the chains are secured under the same validator set. 
Now there is talk in Cosmos of like, okay, well, couldn't a validator just run as a validator on all of those parachains or all of those all of those uh, different zones? And well, yes, but then you're using 100 times the computing resources. Whereas one of our goals with Polkadot was that you don't need a supercomputer to be a validator. You need a strong computer, but you don't need a supercomputer. Awesome. Well, thank you for that answer. Um, what are the main challenges to growing early adoption of parachains? And I guess maybe we can break that down into, you know, what chains out there like Edgeware versus chains out there like Moonbeam, right? So one that launched as a substrate based chain that plans to migrate to being a parachain, whereas Moonbeam is waiting to launch for, uh, to be a, a, a parachain. So kind of what are your kind of thoughts on, on both of those kind of cases? I think one of the biggest factors is really going to be about developers um, and also enhancing the tooling. Like this is new territory and we have a whole suite of tools around like monitoring substrate based chains, but this is all going to get turned a little bit on its head uh, as people start to deploy those as parachains, just because the consensus mechanisms are different. So all of that stuff is going to have to get, uh, get tweaked. But fundamentally, I think, uh, it's really going to be about like how far we can push the system and how accessible we can make stuff like like para threads to run. Really, a lot of those challenges are going to come at the higher levels beyond the consensus mechanisms of Polkadot, but more in the vein of like the developer tools that we give to teams to make sure that they have a lot of flexibility in terms of how blocks are authored, how their fee structures work, so they can really map it onto their problem domain. Absolutely. And this next question, is, you, you've kind of highlighted a bunch of different examples, but I guess this is within a given time frame. So what kind of parachains do you expect to see over the next year? Where is the most opportunity for new parachains? And, do, and can you give specific examples? Yeah. Well, a lot can happen in a year. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But right now I'm, I'm expecting to see uh, parachains like Akala and Moonbeam. So Akala uh, is, is one of the foremost parachains. They're gonna be a hub for, for DeFi. They're gonna be, um, you know, we've learned a lot about the DeFi space over the last few months or the last year in, in, in Ethereum. Um, and those tools like Stablecoin and Dex, Borrow, Lend, all of that, uh, is going to be all bundled up into one hub chain. I think, of course, the open finance thing is one of the first immediately available use cases that is easier to develop because it concerns only assets that exist within the blockchain. Like I see there's sort of three layers. First, you have assets within the blockchain. Then you have assets that are digital, but outside of the blockchain. And then you have real world objects. So there are some chains experimenting with uh, the real world objects front which is say uh, the nodal network, which I think is very interesting about incentivizing users to run uh, Internet of Things devices and uh, uh, via special RFID, RFID chips. Um, I don't know if that's really gonna be user ready in a year, but I think you know maybe not much longer than that. And then sort of in the middle ground, I really think that file storage is gonna be valid. Like I'd, I'd really like, um, I think that the, the narrative of open finance has somewhat overwhelmed the narrative of let's build a decentralized AWS, let's build decentralized websites and, and user facing applications, social, social media, et cetera. So I think expanding out into that second layer of assets that are digital, but not within the blockchain themselves, so that's going to be your file storage, oracleization, um, decentralized computation, stuff like that. Uh, that's going to be probably a big area to target uh, over the next year. 100%. And, and we're seeing that with a bunch of projects that are really becoming vital to a lot of you know the core decentralization aspects of things that then are anchored on traditional blockchains or now parachains. Um, so for our next question, you know, can a parachain be a relay chain and how feasible would that be? And I guess kind of knowing the answer to this is more, what, what is the time frame that we're looking at um, for something like that? Yeah, uh, well, Aiden, you know the answer. I'm gonna say it anyway. Uh, that is something that we've considered and that's sort of, that's that's the category of solutions that we're considering as uh, Polkadot 2.0, which is this idea of like a, a, 
a deeper tree of parachains and relay chains. So right now we have like a tree with depth one where there's just like one relay chain that has a bunch of parachains. But what if you had parachains that were also relay chains, then the tree gets deeper. And the end result is that maybe messages have to traverse up through the tree and down, but you have this huge computational scalability. This is a series of solutions that we're exploring. We have some research on it already. Um, we have a already a bound, which shows that we can get scalability improvements once you have around, um, I think five or 10,000 validators, but we wanna start paring that down a lot further to see uh, if we can come up with protocols where you can already get scal scalability improvements at say 100 or 500 validators, which are around the amounts of validators that we have on the Polkadot and Kusama networks respectively. Amazing, amazing. Um, so yeah, do do validators need to run only a relay chain node, or do they need to run parachain nodes also? Nope, validators only need to run a relay chain node. That's why we separate the collation logic from the validation logic. The idea is that being able to interpret whether a block is valid is a different property than being able to create a valid block. Amazing. Um, and so how does the relay chain validate the computation done on parachains? Uh, we're using a technology called WebAssembly, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, it's a low level language that's been designed and sort of hacked at by Google, Microsoft, Mozilla, et cetera, for, for like a decade to be the, the replacement for JavaScript. The idea that we have is that you basically just upload a piece of WebAssembly code uh, to the blockchain, to the relay chain, which defines a function. And that function is just something that validators can call and they just pass in the data uh, and they get a result like, hey, was this good or this was bad? Um, and then all of the consensus is driven around this abstraction of like, okay, all validators have to do is load a piece of WebAssembly and call it with the data that they were provided. 100%. Yeah, I mean, you know, I just want to take a second to thank you. First of all, we were a bit delayed today. So thanks for your patience with everything. And again, really appreciate you giving this talk. I know our team is incredibly excited and absolutely committed to realizing, you know, the vision that you're describing. And I just hope that, you know, more people listening today, whether it is right now or on YouTube, as this is being live streamed out, um, can really join the conversation as you know the technologies that you're working on right now are truly making it that much easier to deploy blockchains within the Polkadot ecosystem. And it's getting beyond just something you, know, you are looking to the future for, but truly realizable right now. And so it's an incredibly exciting time to join the Polkadot ecosystem. And I just uh, am looking forward to yeah, what this next year holds. Thank you, Aiden. Hey, it's really great to be here. Um, I think, you know, we're we're fairly similar. We come from a developer background. We're practical people. Um, our goal is not to just like talk in abstract and write papers, but to write code and write tools that people can use. Um, so, it's, you know, it's great to work with, with people like you. Thank you so much, Rob. I really appreciate that and for all the work that you're doing. And uh, we're really excited to to follow up soon. Okay, thank you. I got to run, but really great to be here. Thank you so much, Rob. Have a great evening. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.